The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Six days before Jesus came to Bethany, the whom he agreed There they gave a dinner for him, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. Fragrance of the perfume. But Judas is scary. One of his disciples was about the greatest sin. Why was his perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he, he kept the problem first. He was pure. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you but you do not always have me. And the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there. They came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. The plan to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. There has been a distinct movement among those who discuss the nature of the lectionary and the choosing of lessons and the setting of scripture translations for worship, particularly around the lessons that we hear during Holy Week most of which are drawn from the Gospel of John. And in the Gospel of John, the word Jew is uttered as an epithet to describe a population of people who reject Jesus and seek to do him harm. This wording has been used over the centuries and through generations to justify anti-Semitism and violence against Jewish populations. It was not uncommon during Holy Week in Europe in the medieval times that pogroms would be staged against Jewish households in Christian communities. People had to be very careful in those days. They have to be careful today. The Bishop of Nevada has put out an encyclical to her folks in her diocese asking them if they have it as a practice in their communities to offer a Christian Seder. This is not uncommon. In fact, it's been done here a long time ago. And also to be very mindful of the translations chosen when these readings are offered. To remove Jew for an, and a substitution of religious authority to refrain from cultural appropriation because we are not Jewish. We follow Jesus Christ. We're Christians and we have our own practices, which are rich and full and varied. And I'm very aware in this world where there is more than enough of qualifications over identity and culture. Borders are being set and reset because of war, because of who defines who as what. This is not new to the human race. We are very good at finding ways to take exception at other people's choices, behaviors, identities. An intimate act between a fellow disciple and her teacher with a group of people gathered around them where she chose to offer an extravagant gift to a man who has been preaching for days now that he is about to go to Jerusalem where he will be taken and killed, betrayed and rendered up under the authorities. He will hang upon the cross and die and be laid in a tomb. He has been preaching about this for days now and she decides why wait until he is gone before I offer him this gesture. Such an extravagant and loving thing is chosen to be interpreted by someone who is at the table who is one of the 12. 
instead of seeing it as love, sees it as scandal, sees it as an opportunity for outrage. This should have been taken and sold in the money given to the poor. An unanswerable challenge. Because of course he's right. But of course she's right. I prayed about this before Holy Week on whether or not we would change these words, but instead I've made a conscious choice that I think we need to hold these words up in front of us. We need to see them and understand them for what they are. Words can sometimes be used as wedges to drive division between people. Even words from the gospel. And we, with good conscience and prayer and intention and mindfulness, must read these words aloud and be fully aware of the impact and the import they have had on other generations, even as we mindfully speak them and understand that we need to be different in this day and age. And we need to teach our children that and our children's children that, and they need to receive those gifts. But they cannot turn from history, but instead must understand it and embrace it. Holy Monday is one of those days that the scriptures are so full, so potent, so full of portent that they can do two things for us. The first is they can overwhelm us with the power of the intimacy of what's going on in Jesus' inner circle, even while the world rages around them. And at the same time, it can make us utterly aware that we are called to recognize the universal aspects of human nature working themselves out in these interactions. And know that we are called to a higher way, a higher purpose, a higher word of grace. Everything that we're about to undertake tonight in hearing and absorbing these words some of love, some of hate, need to be held in trust and in prayer. And we need to hold them close, for they will inform us as we make our way through this journey that we are taking with the Christ, this way of the cross, this way to death and new life. We understand and believe in the resurrection. There is no doubt in that. We're not looking for proof of that in this week. Instead, we are actively reminding ourselves and disciplining ourselves to be agents and proclaimers of the resurrection and justice and love of a kingdom of God that is meant not to drive division, but to forge communion. May we share that communion now, knowing that the bread broken here tonight is bread that is broken and offered not only to this fellowship, but to the well-being and peace of the whole world. Amen.